<laughs> Welcome home, Billy. I'm Mark. I'm joined by what I would say the best dressed realtor in all of Tampa Bay, Billy Lolly. Welcome home. How's it going, man? Good, man. It's really great to have you on the episode two of our program. And we're here to talk about real estate, business, and all the cool things that you go through in you know your day-to-day -day business life. Um, you don't be the best dressed guy at Keller Williams Tampa Central by mistake, right? You're, you're in the suit business. Um, you've, you've dabbled in the reality TV business. You've been around. You've done some stuff. But we're here to focus on, you know, the the high production that you do with all of your students and the people that you coach at Keller Williams. And uh, I see a lot of great things going on over there. I've consulted with you with my, myself a couple times. Um, a lot of value you bring to the company. And uh, that's one of the reasons I had you on this episode. And I'm glad to have you. Yeah, man. Thanks. So tell us a little bit about why you're the best dressed guy in the business. I, I know I know you have the backstory. Let's hear it. So backstory is my dad to this day still owns men's clothing stores. Um, I grew up in the business, started probably when I was three years old. I used to make my mom play Mr. Man, and I would sell her clothes. Um, actually started in the business when I was 10. I ran the shoe room uh, and worked my way up. I had, before I got into real estate, I had my own store for six years. Um, when I decided to close that, I was looking for the next thing. I had a couple of buddies that got in real estate and said, let me give it a shot. So, How long ago was that? Seven years now. Seven years in the game. Yeah. And you're kicking butt, dude. I mean, you're you're one of the one of the movers here in, in the, the hot market of Tampa. Yeah, man. You know, it's everything that I've learned from growing up in the retail business transferred over. You know, it's all about sales, treating people right and give them good service, you know, and it the rest comes. Yeah, and, and you, you you said it you said it. There's that foundation, but it's that extra little bit extra that you bring to the table that that makes you know, puts people over the top, a little more successful, a little more attention. Sure. I mean, you could, you could easily have your own Netflix special, your own, you know, it could be, it could be based around Billy. We've got your selling Tampa and the selling sunsets and the million dollar dream homes. And you, you know, you, you could probably dabble in that yourself. Just a little bit. I'm definitely entertaining for sure. <laughs> well, you have dabbled in, in reality TV. I, I was going to save that for later and warm you up a little bit. It's good. We could go right. Into it. <laughs> well, it's no secret. I mean, you, you uh, appeared on below deck. Uh, it was really interesting. I, I saw it a couple years ago and then I saw it again a couple months ago. You know, it's, it's fun. And at the end of the day, reality TV is reality TV. It's there to be exactly what it is. Yeah. Entertaining. Um, I definitely went into it. You know, I've seen the show plenty of times before I actually agreed to be on to it. Um, uh, you know, it was a great experience flying out to Greece and seeing the world and, you know, being on a luxury yacht for three days was amazing. How'd that come about? So a uh, good friend in the business, Nick Buchanan, um, got invited by Nicole Gary, who's a big KW agent out in New York, who was the head charter guest. Um, and two weeks before they were supposed to fly out to go film it, one of the other guests had a scheduling conflict. And Nick's like, who's a good time that could fly to Greece in two weeks? No problem. So I got the call. Nice. Back in the day, uh, I almost went to Judge Judy. Nice. And it was a it was a conspiracy with me and a friend of mine where we, we conspired on like a real story that happened. But we we're like, hey, why don't we go to Judge Judy? They're going to pay for our flights, put us in a Hollywood hotel and give us some money. And thank God I didn't go and do that. <laughs> it's <laughs> thank bro, God I, I didn't do that. You should have. It's an experience. <laughs> it would still be on YouTube. And I didn't realize that producers were snaking me. They were on the phone with my friend, my friend. <laughs> right. And like, hey, look, you know, we know you guys are friends, but this is going to make good TV. This is going to like, let's. And, and they got some information out of her that I didn't want to get out. Oh, yeah. And lo and behold, I missed my flight. <laughs> <So> <laughs> that happened. M missed it on purpose. I missed it. On my friend, though, I was in broad. Well, that was the thing. I was in broadcasting school at the time back in 05. Okay. And for me to get flown out to Hollywood and be on a cable television show. It was a big deal. Seemed like a good thing for me. Yeah. Thankfully, I had a little, a little bit of like foresight that I probably wouldn't have been a great idea to go tell that story you know about why exactly i got stopped at canadian customs and they wouldn't let me oh. into my own country of birth <laughs> this sounds like an entertaining story <laughs> yeah i've had a few of those i grew up in detroit which is uh like 10 10 minutes or five minutes from the either the ambassador bridge or the tunnel right. to windsor the, the, to get to canada so i've been in and out of the canada um, hundreds of times over that 20 years and probably a good handful, half a dozen of those times all have very interesting stories. Anywhere from counterfeit bills in my pocket that weren't, <laughs> that sh should have never been there because I don't have anything to do with that right. stuff. Uh, counterfeit bills, um, 
allegedly drug instances, but we don't know. We're not sure, yeah. you know, but, but definitely some good stories. I don't know if they're real estate related. But I mean, the customs needs something to do. <laughs> You know, I've, 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 I've never been arrested at customs with all of those things that have happened. I have never been arrested, never had my car impounded, but yet it all felt like my life was ending in those moments. Oh yeah. I mean, that's where the gift of gab and being a good talker comes into play, man. Oh my gosh. <laughs> some stuff I can't even say on this show. Remind me later. So, uh, let's clear up some of those fan theories. I love it. Let's go. That that circulated. Because um, one of the things I am really, really enjoyed was the fact that the fans got so into your appearance on Below Deck. And by the way, Below Deck doesn't make headlines very often unless Billy Lolly's on there <laughs> doing his thing. So fan theories, uh, basically, you're, you're on the show. Um, I really don't want to paint the picture. I'd rather you do that. Yeah. So basically, you know, we get on the show at noon um, on Thursday. And before we got on, the producer was like, hey, you know, be yourself. Do what you do. I'm like, I'm on vacation. I'm going to drink and have a good time. So when we got the first got on the boat, we had a security board. And literally, that's all I had to eat all day. So out in the sun, crushing drinks. We get back to the boat after being at a beach club. And everybody's like, we're taking naps. No, nope, I don't do naps. <laughs> so I'm hanging out with the crew, doing shots. Um, we're supposed to have dinner at 8. It was either 8 or 8.30. Um, but when you charter a, a boat... You can't start dinner until the head charter guest comes. So lo and behold, she's two hours late. So don't start dinner till about 10, 1030. By this time, I'm feeling pretty well. <laughs> Sauce, Might, sauced up. A little, little bit. A little bit. <laughs> Might have been falling asleep a little bit at dinner. Should have napped. Yeah. <laughs> uh, definitely should have napped. <laughs> so literally dinner was a seven course tasting dinner. And I'm not going to lie. Might have been falling asleep here and there. I definitely crushed the dinner. So you didn't care where the lobster was from. It was just too good. No, no. By the way, editing, phenomenal. by the way, the editing that they do, I mean, they oh, leave all the, great. probably all the stuff out. They made, you know, all the, the fat and whatever. They just oh, yeah. narrow it all down. They, they, the editing is amazing on that show. I will tell you. <laughs> so Throwing in some audio effects here and there. Oh yeah. If they will. <laughs> so after dinner, I kind of snap back out of it. And we end up hanging out till like 4.30 in the morning. Um, the next morning, I wake up, still drunk. I'm not even hungover. Um, go to breakfast, start crushing some drinks there. Go out on a paddle board. And all of a sudden, I get called in to see the captain. I'm like, yeah, whatever. So I go in to the captain, and he's like, so. Now, is he a captain or a TV doctor captain? No, like, he's a legit captain. All right, but so, that's not that's not licensed by the state or anything. That's just right, yeah. like I'm, I'm a captain. Yeah. Hey, look at me. I am the captain now. <laughs> so he calls me in, and I'm like, "What's going on?" And he's like, "So two of the crew members say they saw a white powdery substance under your nose last night." I go, "I'm not doing cocaine. Search my shit. Do whatever." I go, "There's nothing here." So the show shows me very calm and put together when I do it. Right. But they don't show me really go off the deep end, yell at this guy and go off. Because, listen, if you're going to accuse me of doing something, have prove it. Prove it for one and have a better source than a, maybe a white powdery substance under your nose. So, literally, we go down to uh, my cabin, searches all my stuff, does, of course doesn't find anything. And he goes to me, just because I can't find it doesn't mean you don't have it or didn't have it. So, I go off on him again. And two, this is where the editing comes in because the sequence that this all happens is in a different sequence on the show. So it all happens real over like probably 20, 40 minutes of the couple times me and him going back and forth. And on the show, they edit it to where it happens in the morning. We go have lunch and then I go back at him again. So the editing comes in really well. And then, of course, anybody that's watched the show, they show me numerous times going into a bathroom or my cabin, zooming very close up to the door so you can't see what time of day it is or anything, and you hear a sniffling sound. So, yeah, they the editing was done very well. Uh, but I'll tell you what, I had a blast. You tell me I'd have to go through the same situation again, I'd go do it again. It was fun. 
Yeah, and I respect that. And I'll repeat what I said to you off there is, I mean, that's not going out without you signing a release. Correct. And I think that speaks in volumes of the whole situation. In yeah, yeah. Sense. you know, I definitely signed my life away. I knew I was getting into. They pay uh, you? No. They didn't I, pay you? I paid to be on it. Uh, well, you got some lobster out of it. Yeah. 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 But, uh, <laughs> and too, like, I knew how they were going to portray me when it all rolled out. Why is that? What, what, what was, what gave you that idea? So, well, I mean, like after the whole situation of me getting accused. So like, like I said, watched the show plenty of times mm. and I knew we were the, the last charter guest. So I knew I'd be on the last two episodes. So I knew that I'd be on the end of the second to last episodes and the beginning of the last episode. So I knew I'd be the cliffhanger to get you to watch the finale. Did he do it or did he not? And I, <laughs> of course, is exactly how it played out. Did he but, do it? No, he did not. He didn't do it. No, and that's official. That is official. All right, fair enough. Hey, you're my guy. I'm I'm hey, here listen, to ask the questions, not the I'll, judge. I'll be the first to admit I was hammered. <laughs> well, I mean, and what about that lady that cared so much about like what religion the lobster was or whatever? She's like, aren't they like Judeo Christian? Like, get out of here! She, did, she didn't think they were Mediterranean. <laughs> Mediterranean. <laughs> How do you know? I don't know. They were damn good though. So you see how it played out on the show. She was so. <laughs> Adamant. Like bougie in a like a, a turn on. Like I was like, who is this lady? And how did she get there? I'm Leave just, Billy alone too. She, by the way, you know, Nicole's great. Bro. She's uh, <laughs> she was the head of charter guest. You know, I get it. We, oh, that's we, the one that was late. Two hours late. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So and, we, you know, we all have our things. You know, <laughs> um, I think the fans loved you, Billy. I think uh, you know, there's something think there. For, there's definitely something there. For the most part, I think they did. And it, you know, I thought social media was going to have a field day with me. You know, I thought overwhelmingly most people would say he did it this and that i was actually shocked at a lot of comments that i read a lot of people said that i didn't do it there was quite a few that probably said that i was abusing prescription drugs instead which i thought was pretty funny um, i saw that but um and probably one of the better ones was there was a, the one comment i remember was this guy who's like I'm, i was a dj on a corfu for nine years wow. he goes they're so strict about Coke. There's no way he had it. So, yeah, that's another that's another thing that comes with that whole situation. Had that actually been the case, that means you are smuggling cocaine into Greece from America, which can land you in like uh, a yeah. dirty jail forever, <laughs> forever, <laughs> really dirty jail forever. <laughs> I'm definitely not the drug mule. <laughs> it seems like when Americans go abroad and they get locked up, they don't go to regular jails. They go to like places with soil on the ground. Oh, yeah. And they want to make an example for sure. <laughs> to go to the worst place possible. You dirty Americans. <laughs> hey, that is, whoa. So glad you cleared that up. And I want to circle back quickly again. I, yeah. I have to say, I, I read a lot of the fan stuff because there's two sides to every story, right? And Again, I digress more. You said that they edited out the part where you're really defending yourself, Correct. which I think is really important for them to show. At least show you defending yourself, not them just hammering. Like, not just let you be the nail, right? But you could be the hammer too, so that that people can actually take a side and, and, and judge, decide for sure. Yeah, it was a little bit unbiased, but people. And when I say people, like the social media people you're talking about, they love genuine people, even if there's a little bit of stink to it or a little bit of bad guy or bad boy. They, or bad girl. Oh, yeah. They they like it as long as it's genuine and it's not hurtful. Sure. Most in most cases, because people don't want just a regular goody two shoes because that's boring. Yeah. A little bit of uh, polariz a polarizing characteristics without being too offensive. That's the stuff that really gets, and that's why the show made the headlines. For sure. That's really it is, and I'm not here to like the whole purpose of bringing that up wasn't about were you doing it. It was about actually shedding some light on it, and maybe in a more positive sense, because there is some positivity there. Oh yeah. It was yeah, a great experience. That's like fun. I, I do it again. Good stuff. If you forgot anything about it, feel free to bring it up later. Uh, so let's switch gears. Let's pivot to the Tampa market. Right. One of, I would say, probably one of the top five sought after markets in America right now. Uh, we are went from scorching hot to just simmering. Uh, so <laughs> right now, it. while the market's still... It's still moving and, and how people are still buying homes. There's a lot of things shifting. Um, appraisals are coming in short. Interest rates are going up basically every other week by a half or they just went up 0.75 yesterday, which is the biggest jump since 1994. So a lot of things are happening. The market's shifting. And um, I just wanted to set the table with that and kind of get your thoughts on the way the market's shifting and where do you think it may be going over the course of the next year or so? Yeah, you know, here's the deal is... 
people just need to adjust to everything that's happening because and even though interest rates are going up, they're still historically low. But the issue is when you have a client, let's just say looking at a home that's six hundred thousand dollars for the past four months, and now interest rates have jumped and they can only afford five hundred thousand, those are two totally different homes. So you're gonna have two types of buyers. You're gonna have one that's just gonna get out of it because they don't want to deal with it. And then two, you're going to have the person that's going to take that time to adjust and realize, okay, I need to buy a home. This is what I can afford now. And they're going to go buy it. Um, you know, it's interest rates aren't stopping people from moving here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're still going to have competition, you know, it's settling down a little bit. So instead of a house selling in a weekend, you know, now it's taking two, three, four weeks to sell. And instead of being up against 10 to 20 offers, you might be the only offer or you might be up against two or three. Um, so, you know, it's it's starting to go back more to a little bit of a normal market. Um, it'll be interesting to see how this summer plays out because, you know, most families want to be into their new house before the start of a new school year. So I think the summer is going to be a good judge of how the next is going to set us up for the next year. So you, just from the real estate perspective, um, investments in property and stuff like that, how in uh, from your perspective and your knowledge, how does the rising interest rates combat the inflation that we're going through in all these super high, you know, uh, high, highly priced homes and stuff like that? How, how, does, how is that going to help combat that? Yeah, I mean, it's inevitable. You know, there we've held interest rates historically low for so long. I mean, it just was inevitable that they, they're going to come up. I mean, one of the things I tell my clients is, look, if I was a credit card company and I'd hand you a credit card for $200,000, even at an 8% interest rate, you'd be stupid not to take it. So, you know, it's, you t you've got to take everything into consideration. You know, eventually they'll come back down and you'll refinance. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. It feels like there's a lot at stake when they start jacking the interest rates up at a fast pace. Now, like you said, historically still low you know we were dealing with double digit uh, well not we i was i was still a young chap but double digit interest <laughs> well, rates sure. just a couple decades ago or so my three decades ago my parents when they bought anywhere from 15 to 18 percent there you go see 18 some people are saying oh it was 12 percent at one point well it was also 18 and 19 percent and if you had bad credit it was probably more yeah so yes yeah, still historically low but right now you know we're living in today and a lot of people got used to where we are today so i feel like there's a lot at stake there when you're jacking it up because not only homes it's not just the homes that are being affected it's everything from credit card purchases cars oh, all sure. the lines of credit and you know, anything that you can think of um so what they're probably trying to do is get people to slow down on buying so that there'll be less demand and and, and kind of and level out the supply and demand correct yeah i mean you know that's what's driven the market so much is there's been no supply. You know, there's new homes that have been coming into the market every week, but they get bought up in two, three days. So now it, we're looking like we have more supply. There's not more homes than before coming to market. They're just staying longer. So, you know, when a couple months ago, when stuff, when our inventory was so low, if you would look at pendings and sold, there was a ton of them. It's just they were getting bought up real quick. So, yeah, I mean, you know, that's when you do raise prices and all that. It's, of course, going to slow down the buying pow power of people to hopefully catch up the supply a bit. But, you know, I think we're still at today only about a month supply if nothing new came. Yeah, which is the same as the, the last couple of years. It's been a, yeah. approximately a month, right? So y you are all, one of the core talent and production coaches at Keller Williams Tampa Central. So with this topic we're on, what are you telling your students that consult with you? You know, it's, it's you shift into the new market. You know, just like a lot of my newer coaching clients, when they got in the business, they got into what people were calling a crazy market. You know, it just was a heavily seller's market, and you had to figure out what's the right way to navigate that market, especially for a newer agent, because, you know, when you're new, you mostly are working with buyers. So, you know, you have these buyers that were getting beat out. So, you know, you teach them the strategies to put in a strong offer, how to make your offer stand out and, you know, to try to win the business. Now we're starting to shift a little bit to go a little bit towards the buyer side, but it's still definitely a seller's market. Um, so, you know, as it shifts, you know, instead of, you know, just 
hey, the house was listed at 500. You need to offer 550, 600 to get it. Now, you know, there might be some negotiatings, you know, that you might be able to get some better terms for your buyer and not have to, you know, waive appraisals, pay 50 grand over if it doesn't appraise. Um, so it's, you know, looking where the market's going and figuring out how to shift into that market to do the business. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of re-education going on too, not just with us as realtors, but with buyers because they got so used to something and then some of them are ready to make that, that leap now. And right. they might not have to. What we told them two or three months ago or six months ago is just not the case now. So it's a little bit of re-educating the, the client, whether it's the seller or the buyer. Oh yeah. I mean, and two sellers, sellers, the more bigger one that needs re-educated now because sellers, you know, think if their house doesn't sell in the first weekend, what's wrong with it? You know, um, I had a house, we priced it right. It sat for four weeks before we got it under contract. You know, we didn't have to do price reductions because we priced it right. Um, but you have a lot of sellers that have been getting greedy in this market. So mm -hmm. right now, if you were trying to push the limits and overpriced it, you better be doing price reductions in the market if you really want to sell the house. Yeah, and that, that's a hard conversation sometimes with the seller. I'm working with a seller now who's selling a, a home in Tampa. We have it listed, and um, I have to give him a lot of credit for his just awareness of, of something that's not his expertise. Um, he texted me last night. He said, hey, um, just according to the trends, next week we might have to do a $10,000 price reduction. And in my, I'm not telling him, hey, you're right, but in my mind I'm saying, thank God this guy gets it because I'm going to have that conversation with him next Thursday. And he's already had it with himself. Right. Which makes life a million times easier. Um, I have clients that we have their house listed right now and you know, they heavily rely on me and he's like, do you think we should do a price reduction? I'm like, you know, let's ride it out one more weekend, see where we go. And then, you know, we'll talk about it next week, but you know, most likely it'll end up happening. Let's talk a little bit about your co coaching techniques. Um, Keller Williams has a few court, core coaches, my personal coach, Yvonne, and then um, Brie Allison just came in. And of course yourself, Billy Lolly, uh, the core coaches in house at Tampa Central's uh, Keller Williams office. Talk a little bit about your coaching techniques. Um, let's say somebody joined Keller Williams tomorrow and they decided to work with a coach. You know, what, what, what is it that a new agent at Keller Williams can get out of a coach? And by the way, can I just Put a little tack on yeah. that. Keller Williams pays for your coach. It comes, it, they have two different uh, commission, uh, two different kind of commission structures. One of them, you, you get, you one of them, you basically get the same either way. So I don't want to put the numbers out there on the show. You can, you can contact us for that kind of stuff. But basically either way, you are making this, you're pocketing the same amount of money either way. And they're helping you pay for the coach. And that's just so invaluable. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, on that aspect, they make it so when you have a coach and you you, you know start out you need one, um, but they make the coach the cost of the coach not be an addition to what you would be paying to the brokerage. So, you know, um, coaching is definitely key. You know, one we're going to teach you how to start your business and we're, you know what you should be doing to get business once you get it, how to maintain it and get it to the closing table. And, you know, we help you try to structure how to really turn real estate into a career and not just, you know, randomly get a deal here or there. You know, how do you go out there and really lead generate it to get steady business so you're not on the roller coaster ride like most agents are where, you know, you have a great month here. You might not do anything for two or three months. Um, so, you know, keeping that getting to learn how to keep your pipeline full so, you know, the money steadily comes in instead of riding the waves. Sure. And when you when you bring on a new new talent has never done this before, you know, what are the maybe one or two things that you come across that definitely usually need to be addressed in that first, you know, couple of sessions? Yeah. I mean, so here's the biggest thing is, you know, I would say the majority of the people um, got to get out of their comfort zone and. The main one is picking up the phone and calling people. Um, you know, the way you should start out your business and once you grow it to a certain point is your sphere. And that's for most people, they don't have a database when they come into um, the business. So it's literally pick up your phone, look at every contact in that phone. It's somebody you've known, you have a relationship with. That's where you should be growing your business out of. 
So, you know, even if you haven't talked to somebody in two, three years, whatever it is, you know, text them, call them, you know, start that dialogue and conversation and don't be that secret agent, you know, right. tell everybody, Hey, this is the new thing I'm doing. And, you know, reconnect with anybody because even if that person is not in the position to buy, sell or invest, I mean, there's, they know a ton of other people. So, you know, you never know where business is going to come from or who somebody's going to connect you to. And from my experience so far, expect the unexpected. Don't expect your best friend to buy a house from you. Expect the guy that you normally don't talk to, but know to buy a house from you. And that happens. My first deal I made was like that. I was a, a hockey commissioner in Clearwater for their ice hockey uh, adult leagues and all that. And there was this um, sweet guy who I know now. His name's William and shout out to William. He's, a, he's really cool. Um, they had an issue, but I digress. He was the guy that always gave me the stink eye. He was the scorekeeper. Every right. time I see him, be like, hey, Mark, with the stink eye. But he was my first deal. And he's a sweet guy. And, and next thing you know, he's buying a house with his family cash in Temple Terrace. And I closed my first deal inside of a month of being a licensed realtor because I didn't limit myself to, well, that guy doesn't, he might not like me. Don't assume anything, you know, just all I did was have a quick conversation. He told me, oh, we've got to be out of our apartment in a month and something clicked. I went from helping him find a trailer to rent to exploring all of his options. And next thing you know, his uh, an in-law of his helped him buy a house cash. And I know that's a unicorn story. It's not happening every day. But the point is to expect the unexpected and to, to sure. explore. And, and to love all my family and friends. But when you do deals with them, they're usually the worst deals. <laughs> um, you know, for whatever reason, um, do they expect more out of you? Uh, you know, it's, they, you know, always expect more. Um, but it just, there's always seems to be the most problems when you do it with family and friends. Um, I'm not telling them not to take the business, um, because of course they're the people that want to see you do well. Um, so they're here to support you. Um, just expect it to be a, probably a little bumpier ride than your normal deal. Right. More emotion involved in. Exactly. Yeah, I can I could see that. And I, I can see that just, you know, dabbling with my father who wants to find his waterfront for his boat. Yep. And and it's like I've told my wife, Lala, who's my partner time and time again, like, hey, when he's ready, leave me out of it. Yeah, <laughs> like, leave sure. me out of it. Let's refer him out. <laughs> so I totally get that. Yeah. Um, one of the last things I wanted to, to, to tackle uh was something that's interesting. I feel like it's the evolution of the real estate business or one of the aspects of the evolution of the real estate business. Uh, just a little bit of a paintbrush like comment here. Okay. I uh, take it with a grain of salt, but historically let's say from the nineties and back, or even from the early two thousands and before that real estate was an old man's job or, or a matured older persons. It wasn't where we are today. And you would have, of course you had females in the business. Don't take that, term to heart, but it was an older person's job. And I feel like those people are being phased out slowly and it's becoming a young man, a young woman's job who knows how to handle marketing and social media and knows how to live in today. So my point is that I'm kind of getting at is I feel that we're evolving into a young person's business. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, here's the great thing about our business is you're right. Earlier, you know, it was older generations, um, but the great thing about our job is as long as you can adapt to where we're at in today's market and how to get business, I mean, literally you could do this job until you don't want to, um, you know, I don't want to be grinding it out and selling houses when I'm 80, but if you, that's what you wanted to do, you definitely can. Um, and too, I mean, it gives you something to do when you're older. Uh, but yeah, I mean, no matter what age you are. You better learn how to use social media and everything out there at your fingertips. Because if you're not, one, you're missing business. And two, you're probably not going to see as much as you should. Fair enough. Fair enough. Billy, as you said, adapt or perish. That's how it goes. It's been awesome talking, Billy. Uh, we're going to cut it a little bit short. That way we leave him hanging. Maybe we'll, uh, did he do it or did he not? <laughs> a little cliffhanger. <laughs> there you go. It's been a pleasure, Billy. Yep. Let's go get some deals done. I know you've got one to get done and... I've got one to try to save today, so... Got to go get done, bro. It's been a pleasure, man. Yep. Welcome home. I'm yep. Mark.